Welcome everyone, Michael here with DeFi Yield, and I am excited to have with us today someone who you might know of, George Gammon, and we're going to talk all about global macroeconomics, we're going to talk about freedom, we're going to talk about capitalism, and, uh, and many other things. So thanks for being with us today, George. Thank you for having me on, I appreciate it. Yeah, 100%. Just in case people aren't familiar with you, do you want to give kind of a quick little background on yourself and uh, who you are? Well, I retired in 2012. Mm -hmm. And then in 2019, I started a TV show here yeah. in Medellin. So I had to hire all the editors and camera people. I was the executive producer, as well as the director. And I, I was in the show as well. And uh, after that show ended, we did 13 seasons, or excuse me, 13 episodes of the first season. <laughs> And I had all these editors, so I figured it'd be a good idea to start a YouTube channel. Yep. And uh, initially, the YouTube channel was kind of on real estate investing because that's what the TV show is about. Mm -hmm. And um, but I was always more passionate about macro. Mm -hmm. uh, since I retired, it was just not even a hobby; it was more of an obsession. Yeah. And so I started doing some videos on on macro topics on the channel, and I didn't think anyone would watch them. But uh, sure enough, a lot more people watched the videos on macro than watched the videos on real estate. <laughs> so yeah. I thought, well, this is perfect because that's really what I want to talk about anyway. Yep. So I just kept doing that within, I don't know, eight or nine months or so. We had 100,000 subscribers on the on the channel. And then I started the Rebel Capitalist Show, which is a podcast that now gets over, I think, a million downloads a month. Nice. And we've got uh, the Rebel Capitalist channel now, which is a second kind of an offshoot where I do a lot of live streams. Mm -hmm. We just crossed over the 100,000 subscriber mark there. And uh, on the main channel that we started in in mid-2019, where I do a lot of whiteboard videos on macro, we've got about 450,000 subscribers. Perfect. Sounds great. Well, maybe I'll start by asking you a bit of a, a challenging question. And that is, I mean, macro is super fun, right? It's fun to think about. It's fun to kind of understand the interlocking causality of things, et cetera. Uh, but you're traditionally an investor. And I find most macro people are not very good investors. Their, uh, their returns tend not to be great. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it depends on <clears throat> the timing. Yeah. And I think there are certain cycles when uh, macro people will do extremely well. And I think you'd have to define macro, right? I mean, is Stan Druckenmiller, is he macro? Because he's done all right. I, I wouldn't uh, say so. I would think of him as a little bit more, but you're right. Yeah, he does. Uh, I mean, he's really big. I, I would say he's both, Yeah. right? I mean, he's really paying attention to the Fed. Obviously, yeah. you got it to be that good in FX. Mm -hmm. You got to know what's going on from a standpoint of macro. Mm -hmm. I mean, even look at some of the bets that Soros made. I mean, those were mostly macro bets and in the FX market. So I don't know that you can really separate the two. I, I would argue that if you're someone who really just gets into the nitty gritty and is all about micro or like real, like most real estate investors, as an yep. example, yep. I would say if, if you might not need to specialize in macro, but if you ignore it altogether, mm -hmm. it's going to be a huge blind spot mm -hmm. that is going to come back and, and bite in the butt. Mm -hmm. And we saw that during the GFC, you know, I mean, how many real estate investors were just saying to themselves over and over and over again, that location, location, location. Yeah. Okay. All I got to worry about is the school district. Yeah. All I got to worry about is the incoming jobs. Yeah. All I got to worry about is, you know, X, Y, and Z, all of these local things. And the rest will just take care of them uh, itself because I'm using nominal debt. And we know that nominal prices in the United States have never gone down. So I've got nothing to worry about. And they're completely ignorant of the euro dollar market. They're completely ignorant as to what's going on with the Federal Reserve or interest rates or any of these things. And they get completely annihilated. Uh -huh. So I, I, I don't know that I'd say definitively that people who are in the macro space or tend to think in terms of macro are, are poor investors. Cool. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great answer. I appreciate that. Um, kind of the next thing that I'd be curious to hear your, uh, your opinion on, because you've got background in macro and in real estate, is obviously real estate, I don't know, for the last probably 70 years has been broadly pretty good as an investment. You could have bought, and if you were holding for the long term, 
buying cash flow properties at reasonable prices, et cetera, the prices tended to go up. Um, now, they tended to go up faster than the rate of inflation, too. And no. if we, what was that? That's not, yeah, that's not true. No, that's not accurate? Not even close. No. From 1900 to the end of the 1990s, real estate was flat when you adjust um, for inflation. So then you go from 97, 98 to 2006, and it goes parabolic. And then in 2006, you max out, and you come back down, and you bottom out almost on the historic trend line, going back to 1900. Uh, and then it goes right back up to where we have been recently, where it's even higher than it was in 2006, not just in terms of inflation adjusted price, but also, in my opinion, what's even more important is the price to income ratio. Yeah, so a couple couple things on that, because I've seen you mention that. Uh, so I think it's interesting to, and maybe that's part of the answer, is looking back, because you're looking back to 1900. If we look back, for example, from start of 1980, it was definitely good to buy real estate, and it definitely exceeded the rate of inflation. Well, I mean, again, where, what are you comparing it to? Because if you're comparing it to, let's say, the early 1980s to the late 90s, I don't. I don't think you're really. You're, I don't think you're really up too much. And if you are, you know, if you annualize it, I don't think the return would have been that great in real terms. Now, if you, if you're leveraging that with a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, and you've got positive cash flow on top of that, then absolutely. But if you're just looking at, uh, you know, the appreciation rate adjusted for inflation, again, it's it's not that great. I always say that it, real estate doesn't appreciate; it only inflates meaning it only goes up with the, with the rate of inflation. I mean, it definitely, in a lot of areas, has gone up faster than the rate of inflation, at least over the last few decades. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of cyclical markets, uh, like uh, California as an example, yeah. uh, and then when you see waves of people moving someplace like Dallas, Texas, you'll yeah. absolutely see uh, a price appreciation that exceeds the rate of national inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's for sure. But um, if you look at the, the the housing market in total, uh, then you would see that uh, it really doesn't go up too much in price. And that makes a lot of sense because, yeah. you know, in uh, wages, incomes are loosely tied to the rate of inflation, although they lag a bit. And so if you've got, uh, you know, wages is a component, should be at least a component of housing prices along with interest rates. Uh -huh. So if you keep interest rates at a, at a, at a steady line, and then assuming that wages go up with inflation, it's no surprise that the housing market sit, pretty much stays up with the rate of inflation, uh, just because it's a derivative of basically wages and interest rates. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, fundamentally, affordability would be the, you can only spend what you can afford, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so I guess that's kind of coming to the thing, which is, so we've seen this sort of overperformance. Do you think that as a result, of that overperformance over the last few decades that we're going to see underperformance in the next few decades. Do you think that's likely or? I, I don't know in the next few decades. I would say in the next uh, five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we look at the peak in 2006 yeah. and then we look at that bottom that we hit in 2012, mm -hmm. when it got back down close to that historic trend line, and mm -hmm. I'm talking about uh, prices. And actually, if you look at price to incomes, it got back down below five which is kind of a historic no norm as well. In 2006, it got up to about seven. Mm -hmm. And recently we're up closer to between seven and, and eight before we started to come back down. But usually that takes a long time. Uh, yeah. People think that the real estate market quote unquote crashes and it does, but it takes years for it to yeah. crash. <laughs> it's like a slow moving train wreck, yeah, right? Yeah. So uh, it doesn't really happen overnight. And so I do believe that adjusted for inflation mm -hmm. prices will come down close to where they were in 2012 but but again most people struggle with that because yeah. i'm not saying that nominal prices have to come down in yeah. fact we could see nominal prices stay the same sure but we just see that, that annual inflation let's say is just hypothetically 10 percent yeah. and the next thing you know you wake up five years and 10 percent annualized inflation or annual inflation compounded Yep. All of a sudden, you're down 60% yep. right back where you were in 2012, even though the nominal price mm -hmm. of the house maybe even went up by sure. a percent or two per year. 
Yeah. So uh, that's I, I think that's really most likely what you're going to see. You know, if you look at the housing market in the 1970s, yep. it's also very interesting mm -hmm. because nominal prices did go up substantially. Yes. But over the decade, you were pretty much flat. And then during a certain times, uh, prices came down a little bit. Now, that said, the prices didn't start anywhere near as close to as high as they were in 2006 or they have been, you know, just as of about three or four months ago before prices started to come down. Yep. So I think that we've got a longer way to come down, but it might look similar to the, the 70s where you do see nominal prices go up uh, rather consistently, but in real terms, it's, it's kind of a roller coaster ride. Interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting theory. And so then the thing that kind of fits in with that is, so real estate's a hyper-local asset. Right, you can have it go up in. It, one it area can be, and it, it at times, most of the time, it is. I completely yeah. agree, but there are times when that tsunami of macro mm -hmm. will overwhelm whatever's going on at a local level. And so, in if you take the world, if you look beyond the U.S., uh, are there particular parts of the world that you think are likely to perform better in terms of real estate? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you look at Canada, you look at the United States, you look at Australia and uh, parts of Europe, and these are housing markets that are just at nosebleed levels. So, uh, you know, no matter what type of investor you are, I think it's wise to try to buy low and sell high. Yeah. Or as I say, you want to buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive. Yeah. And there is nothing cheap about the U.S. market or Canada or Australia <laughs> or, or, or most of uh most of Europe. So you, I, I personally would avoid that. Now, people ask me, oh, have you just sworn off U.S. real estate forever? Absolutely not. No way. U.S. US real estate is a phenomenal asset class, but I'm just going to wait till it's cheap. Yeah. And if it's not cheap, well, then to your point, I'm just going to go somewhere else. And maybe I have to diversify asset classes, which is what I've done you know, more recently. I, I'm, I'm completely agnostic when it comes yep. to location of real estate, but I'm also agnostic when it comes to the asset class. And uh, I just want to just buy things when they're cheap and sell them uh, when they're expensive, regardless of where or, or what they are. Now, yep. within, that, within that framework, I have specific parameters for building the portfolio. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that later if you want, but going back sure, to your yeah. main okay. question, yeah, I mean, I, I I like markets that are non-correlated because I think you're going to go into a global recession in 2023, or at least the probability is high. Mm -hmm. So I, I like non-correlated assets. So how do you find that in terms of real estate? Well, I'll just go back to the GFC and just look at what markets could be uh, potentially cheap right now that didn't really seem to have a significant downturn as a result of what we went through in, call it 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, most of those markets you'll see have very little debt in them. Mm -hmm. uh, as an example, you know, I'm in Medellin, Colombia right now. And in Colombia, it's the, the number of people that own homes that actually have a mortgage mm -hmm. is incredibly low, yeah. incredibly yeah. low, you know, maybe yeah. five, 10 percent at the most. Yeah. And so it's, it's very difficult to have a real estate crash here in Colombia because no one needs to sell. Because yeah. no one has a mortgage payment. Yeah. And people look at real estate here in a much different way than they look at real estate in the West, uh, specifically in the United States. In the United States, people look at real estate, number one, or nowadays, maybe even number two, as a roof over their head. Yeah. And uh, and then also an investment. It, yep. It's where, you know, it's your it's your retirement. It's where uh, X percent of your, your net worth is. And um, Colombians and South Americans and people across the world they they see it as a, a good place to store your uh, your your net worth, but they also kind of look at it as a savings account, mm -hmm. and they also look at it as a generational asset. Yeah, which they buy it and they just pass it down to their kids and their kids and their kids. So the you know the family basically, whoever the the guy was that bought it in the first place, is just doing this to benefit future generations, so they never have to worry about putting a house a, a roof over their head. Yeah, and a worst case scenario. And, you know, outside of the United States, they're a lot more family oriented in most places as well. So this is something that is a significant difference. Yeah. And it's also another reason, along with very little debt in the system, yeah. as to why uh, there's a lot less volatility, if you will, 
in uh, nominal prices or, or especially real prices when you get outside the United States. Now, that's not to say that the real estate market here in Columbia is a steal right now. Uh, I'm by no means a buyer. I'm just uh, kind of, a, I've got a hold mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's cheap. I don't think yeah. it's expensive. Uh, now, there are opportunities to where you can make it cheap by finding a motivated seller. Yep. But that's when real estate turns into more of a side hustle yep. or more of a business yep. than it is an actual investment. Now, I am going to uh, Dubai and Turkey at the end of this month, yep. and I will definitely be looking at real estate there. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if there's a significant catalyst to make me pull the trigger in Turkey as of yet. And Turkey I don't even know lot. prices. <laughs> What's that? Turkey went up a lot since uh, over the last year or so. Yeah, and I was going to say, I don't even know that uh, the prices are cheap, no, but there's obviously uh, some some blood in the street there. So we'll have to go to kick some tires and kind of see what's going on. Uh, same thing with Dubai, you know, from 2015 to 2020, uh, their real estate market got absolutely decimated, just, just destroyed with oversupply and lack of demand. And over the last two years, I believe it's come up significantly. But yeah, there could that's... be some pockets of of opportunity there, especially if you're someone from a macro standpoint that believes the world is moving into a bifurcation, uh, similar to what we saw in, let's call it the 1960s, the 1970s, 80s with the Cold War, where you had uh, the world really divided into two. You had the East and you had the West. And the East pretty much does business with the East and the West pretty much does business with the West. And I'm uh, of the belief that that's likely where we're headed. There's no certainties, only probabilities. But that's likely, you know, when you look at the BRIC nations, you look at uh, what's going on with Russia, China, India, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, uh, et cetera. I, I can see how uh, this would become a reality in, you know, throughout the 2020s and moving into 2030. And if, the big if, that is the case, I think there are going to be certain areas uh, outside of the West that could potentially benefit. And one of them would definitely be Dubai. Yeah, I'm in Dubai right now. I love Dubai. I think it's the greatest city in the world right now. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly, certainly bullish on it. Uh, I don't know if that means that it's good for buying real estate right now, but that's a, a little bit of a different, uh, different conversation. So I'd love to yeah. follow up. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, also real estate, it all depends on your time horizon and why you buy it as well. You know, some people are really about uh, cash flow. Some people are, are just pretty much about appreciation. Mm -hmm. And so w within the real estate niche, there's a, a lot of uh, different categories. And, you know, one's, one man's trash is another man's treasure, yep. right? Uh, so <laughs> you could have, like, even when I bought real estate in 2012, Yep. Um, I think there was a strong argument that the looking at just the price of the house, it might not have been extremely cheap. Mm. Uh, I think there's a good argument why it would have been cheap, but I think there was a the the my base case would have been that it was just fairly priced. Okay. Yep. But what was extremely cheap was the cash flow. Yeah. The cash flow relative to your cost basis was was incredibly cheap. Yeah. And so, uh, again, that's just kind of my point that from a cash flow standpoint, if that's your bag, then it made a lot of sense. But strictly looking at uh, price appreciation back then, although we saw significant price appreciation, I don't think anyone could have uh, reasonably predicted that back in 2012. Uh, I don't know if you were in the United States in 2012, but I'm sure a lot of your viewers uh, can remember back that far. And, you know, now it seems crazy to say this, especially to the uh, millennials and may, uh, and then the Gen Z. But in 2012, my goodness gracious, real estate was persona non grata. Yeah. Right. I mean, that that was the it, that was the worst asset class you could possibly invest in. In fact, I remember when I first uh, was talking about going into real estate when I retired, um, my family members thought I was absolutely crazy. It was almost like they're going to have a, 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 a sit down intervention with me <laughs> to talk me out of this madness of buying real estate. Cause everyone knows that real estate always goes down in price uh, because we have that recency bias from 2006 to 2012. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So th this is another thing I I'm curious about when you're thinking about the international markets, because you kind of made this point earlier, and this is something that I always struggle with, is, okay, great. Uh, if you have debt, then real estate appreciations don't have to be that high in order to yield a pretty reasonable cash on cash return. When you go into these other markets, it's definitely harder to acquire debt than it is. Oh, yeah. in If not impossible. Like yeah. So how do you think about that when you're thinking about a global real estate investment perspective? Yeah. So when I was investing in real estate, uh, for me, it was more of that side hustle yeah. we were talking about. So yeah. as an example, I've got a team of people in Medellin, Angie and Joaquin, and uh, Angie's my designer, Joaquin is my architect, and they're a husband and wife team. And I brought them here from Ecuador yep. in 2014 when I first started doing business here. And they really managed that 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 operation. And, and that's exactly what it was. It was an operation. And I was, you know, boots on the ground. I was here, let's call it four or five months a year. They moved here permanently from Ecuador so they could manage that process for me. So my point is, with Angie and Joaquin here, we had a system set up to where we could find motivated sellers. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's really the, the secret sauce. So yeah. um, in a market where you have very little debt, yeah. you usually also have very low liquidity, yeah. especially compared to the West and the United States. It's, it's not like, and I know it's hard for Americans to get their head around, but in uh, other countries, you can't just put your property on the MLS and within an hour you get 40 bids or whatever. Yeah. Uh, even if you've got a fantastic property at a fantastic price, yeah. it's still going to sell you six. It's still going to take you six months to sell it. Right. Uh, if not longer. And it doesn't mean that you've got a bad price or anything. It just means that there's not that many buyers. And you just got to wait for one to come along. And if you get the right buyer, they're going to gladly pay your price. Um, so also if you get a person that for whatever reason gets into financial difficulty yep. to where they have to extract the equity from their house yep. and you're the only guy that's there with a fistful of cash, yep. you're basically going to be able to name your price. Nice. So uh, that's the way I, I made a lot of money and, and very good returns without the use of debt yep. is I was just patient and I had kind of an infrastructure already yep. set up. To where we would kind of bird dog these deals for lack of yep. a better term yep. and i could buy a dollar for 50 cents yep and then you buy that dollar for 50 cents and then you go ahead and make the improvements and you force additional equity or you force additional appreciation yep. and then your your cash flow is just staggering yep. even without debt and then if you choose to go ahead and sell the property then your returns are are significant even though you have to wait, let's just say a year uh, to sell the property. Yep. And so th and if you're dealing with another market, I think, and you can't use debt, the way to really uh, outsize your returns is to, and I know not everyone has access to this, but if, if you do have access to a local provider or an infrastructure, you do the boots on the ground research yep. and you buy that dollar for 50 cents, that that's really the secret. Nice, nice. It's good, uh, good wisdom. Yeah, it's really interesting looking at say the Dubai market because with MLS in North America, you have like kind of a fair market price of everything, and it doesn't mm. deviate that much from there. In Dubai, you could have the same exact unit in the same building that could vary by like twenty or thirty percent up or down because oh, yeah. that's what the seller thinks it's worth, and. It's just, and they won't even negotiate on it either. It's not like you can show them like, hey, well, what about this other guy? No, it's worth this. That's it. And it's a very, that's, very strange, different environment. That's usually the way Columbia is. Mm. And, and, but it's, it's very, uh, what's the right word? Fragmented, I guess would, would be a, a good word. It, it's very inefficient. Yep. Probably be the best word yep. uh, from a standpoint of, since we don't have an MLS, there are, uh, sellers here that yep. have owned their property for let's say 15 years 20 years yep. longer yep. and uh, they they bought it for whatever let's say the equivalent of 10 grand yeah and so now the, you know it, it might be worth 300 yep. but they're selling it for 200 because they think you know a 20x return is just unfathomable 
yep. because they don't know what the yep. comps are. They have absolutely no idea. And you say, well, George, isn't the real estate agent going to tell them that? Okay. Well, now you're assuming they're hiring a real estate agent, with very, <laughs> which very, very few people do. Yeah. You say, well, George, how do they sell their homes? I'll tell you, they just put a for sale sign in the window. Yeah. And it, as shocking as that may sound to gringos, yeah. uh, that's literally the way probably 80% of the, of the properties are sold here in Colombia and even in Medellin, which is a metropolis of 4 million people. It's yep. just by people literally putting a sign in their window and someone walking by and seeing it, liking the area, just calling them on WhatsApp and scheduling an appointment and they kind of negotiate the deal. So, uh, but then there's other people to your point, yep. which will uh, kind of get a whiff of what uh, the, the price per square meter. And yep. they'll think of course that they're, uh, apartment is worth more than that. Yeah. So then they'll just put on the market for some astronomical number. Yep. And then for them, they don't have any debt yep. and they're just living there. So what do they care? They just sit there and wait until yep. someone buys it. If it's two years down the line and they just wait for the market to come to them, yep. well, then so be it. So if you come in at a lower offer, they're just going to tell you to pound sand because yep. who cares? Get yep. out of here. Um, but again, you, it's it's very difficult to do. But with even within that type of market, yep. you're gonna find a buyer that that gets into a pinch. I mean, I'll yep. give you a perfect example. This apartment where I am right now is a penthouse apartment that I bought as a rental about four years ago, mm -hmm. and now I'm currently living here because I set up this little office and whatnot. But uh, back then, the uh, I, I met with the guy that was selling it just because Joaquin was walking by, yep. and he literally just. Saw the for sale sign. So he yep. talked to the, the security guard and they set up the appointment. We came up here, we talked to him and uh, I asked, he actually had an agent and I asked the agent, I said, well, why are they selling? Yep. And he said, well, and I, you know, they're shockingly honest sometimes. Yep. And he says, because the owners actually moved to Miami and they got some serious debt issues Ooh. in Miami and yep. they have to fire sell this thing. They yep. don't have a choice. They have to sell it for basically any price. And that's their agent telling me this. Wow. So I'm that's like, amazing. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, you negotiate and pretty much name your price. Yep. And an hour later, after just going back and forth on WhatsApp, they they agreed to the price. And I got it for 50 cents on the dollar. Good for you. And that's, awesome. uh, that's just an example. So, but, but to your point, 95% of the people out there yep. are going to tell you to pound sand. It's it's going to be very difficult to negotiate. You know, four percent you're going to be able to negotiate a little bit, but then it's about finding that one percent where you can just pretty much name your price. Yeah. And and that's why just going in as like a passive investor, or just like you know, as a gringo looking at uh, properties in Colombia or Dubai or Turkey or whatever, and just kind of googling them on the internet and just yeah. figuring you're going to buy one and make a fortune. You're just you're you're lying to yourself, and ninety nine point nine percent of the time you're going to get smoked. You, yeah. You're 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 going to get crushed. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a cool story. That's a very interesting uh, interesting example. The other thing that I found is really interesting in some of these environments, like especially in the Middle East, is they don't really have a sense of the time value of money. It's like they've been in an environment for long enough where they've had enough cash that time value of money is not really a thing for them. It's like they're happy to have money sitting there and they don't need the money. So why are they worried about the time value of money? And they aren't used to like my wife's from Montenegro and you go and people don't have retirement accounts, right? They just have money in the bank and they have real estate and that's all they have. So mm. there's no sense of like, oh, I could put my money into the stock market, buy the S&P 500 and have it earn 7% a year or something. That concept doesn't exist. So it's a very, very different mindset, which is really, really fascinating. Yeah, because I don't think they had that opportunity. No, exactly. And I, and I would say, I would guess if you went back to the United States in, let's say, the 1950s, mm -hmm. they probably would have had the exact same mentality. Exactly. Yeah. They would say, yeah, exactly. stock market, what, what are you, get out of here, what are you talking about? You know, yeah. and in fact, I remember even growing up in the 1970s, in the 1980s, and none of my friends, none of my friends ever mentioned this. I didn't even know what the stock market was. Yeah. Like even when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, I didn't know what stocks were. I didn't know what bonds were. Yeah. I had absolutely no clue. When I was growing up, it was just well known with, with my group of buddies 
And even this was in, in, in junior high, high school, college, didn't matter it, you know, what age group in there. It, it was pretty much known the only way that you could get rich is if you work your ass off and start a business. Mm -hmm. That was just, that was, that's the way you got rich. Yep. And it wasn't by buying GameStop or, or Shibu Inu or, you know, whatever the, the, the fad is or on some NFTs or something. Yep. Uh, it was just really, you know, kind of getting your hands dirty, taking risk yep. and creating a product, a good or service that people valued more than the the dollars in their pocket. Yep. So even going back that far, uh, I, I think, you know, people didn't have that mentality in the United States. So that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, how um, how uh, predictable would be the returns in the Colombian stock market, which again, I think that's that's a good thing and it can be an opportunity as well. Yep. And I always say that here in Colombia, if the stock market crashed by 50%, most people would never even know. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if it'd make the, the front page of the, of the newspaper yep. because nobody, nobody cares about the stock market. Where yep. in the United yep. States, if it crashed by 50%, obviously the whole world would know oh, yeah. about it. And so, but but I also think that that there's room for opportunity there for people who are willing to again do some like boots on the ground research. You know, one of the uh, stories that I tell occasionally is in 2013. You probably remember this. Uh, remember that they had the bail-ins in Cyprus. Yep. And their stock market went down by 99 percent, I believe. And uh, at the time, I was following, uh, now is a, a good buddy, a guy named, named uh, Doug Casey. Yep. And uh, Doug was talking about Cyprus. So I started looking into it and reading about it. And I set up a, a brokerage account there. Yep. And, uh, you know, I bought some some shares in one of the local hotel chains that they had. Yep. That at the time, was paying like a 10% a dividend yield or something like that. Yep. And I didn't even pay attention to it. You know, I kind of set it and forget it. Yep. And then like five years later, I looked at it and the, the share price had gone up like eight or nine times. Nice. But they increased the dividend to the point where uh, uh, on my cost basis, I was being paid like a 40% dividend <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> yield, something like that. So my point was, so what's the point? And in fact, I was just in the reason I'm reminded of this is because with my uh, one of my assistants, Josh, we were looking at uh, seeing if uh, interactive brokers yep. allows you to buy some of these stocks that I looked at in 2013. Oh, we yeah. can't find them anywhere on there. So we came to the conclusion that the only way you could do that is go through the rigmarole yep. of actually setting up a brokerage in Cyprus or in yep. Istanbul or something like that, and then trying to go and do the homework. And we're asking each other, you know, who on earth, what gringo is going to take the time to do that? when they can just, you know, dump their money into Apple or Tesla or something like that and just do like a, a YOLO trade. Totally. Uh, and, and the fact that most people don't have access or don't even think in those terms, that in of itself could be an opportunity for those people that are willing to get outside the box, totally. willing to totally. do some boots on the ground research and, and maybe take a little bit of risk and diversify your portfolio in terms of uh, geopolitical locations. Absolutely. hundred percent. Uh, there's a book I'm just trying to see here. Uh, have you ever read the book red notice? What was it? Red notice. No, it's an excellent book. It's a, written by the guy who was the first one to go as a hedge fund and invest in Russia after the fall of communism. Oh, British yeah. capital. It's crazy. Cool. Like telling the stories of like how they would buy stocks. Cause they basically took the entire country's assets and they gave one these little coupons to people, which nobody knew what the coupons were worth, but they were worth a one-third share of all these assets. And so they would be trading vodka for these coupons for people and shipping them out. They had to buy everything with cash and then take it like manually to these stock exchanges to get stuff cashed in. And they cleaned up in the 90s. They did incredibly well. But like, what a nuts situation to be in. And really, really hard, right? Like, you had to show up with $20 million of cash, I think was what they first showed up with in whatever it was, 1991 or something. And just a really cool yeah, there's story. A, th th that is cool. There, there's a saying that I believe firmly. Yeah. It's that you make a lot more money yeah. when things go from horrible to bad yeah. than when things go from good to great. Yeah, makes sense. Definitely makes sense. Yeah. 
Um, so I want to circle around to something else that you were saying. You were talking about this bifurcation of the world. And one of the interesting things, one of the, like, they say, you know, one of the most dangerous expressions in investing is this time is different. Um, right. But at the same time, there are some things that are different, right? Like, And so I'm curious to hear what you think uh, will change over the next, I don't know, whether it's decade, few decades, et cetera, due to the fact that this time we have digitization. This time people can work from anywhere. This time people can make money online. This time, like, we're, we're in a, there are some differences with the information age and the internet that didn't exist say in the 60s well i definitely think it's a benefit yeah. for those who are willing to utilize the benefit yeah. but i don't know if that's it's definitely not the majority mm -hmm, for sure uh, i was going to say that i don't know if that's enough to move the needle but I, I think that it is especially with the younger generations because they're so uh, you know, again, when I was growing up, that that just wasn't a thing where you would uh, go to Columbia and work on your laptop or, or yep. that, that just that didn't exist. So it was out of sight, out of mind. Where now I think with Instagram, uh, with YouTube, with social media, uh, kids see is that's a viable opportunity and actually yep. something geo uh, arbitrage, what I'd call it, yep. is a, a, a fantastic opportunity if you're able to make dollars. And have your expenses denominated in in Turkish lira, totally as an example, or, or pesos. I mean that that is a, a windfall. Yep. So um, I think people are becoming more and more receptive to it, and they will as time and they will become more receptive to it as time goes on. But I don't know where they are, uh, you know, in the next two or three years, and how much it will matter. And the, the reason I say that is because I, I get this. Uh, uh, feedback from a lot of the Bitcoin Twitter, right? Uh -huh. Where if the United States government comes in, let's say tries to ban Bitcoin, and I'm, I'm not I'm not in the camp that they will or they won't, or this is not an opinion on that. Yep. But you you hear the pushback that, well, if that's the case, since you can store your net worth in your back pocket, it's not like gold where you've got to just, you know, how do you transport that, right? Or, or like yep. painting or real estate or you know, this is a whole new digital era where you can keep that net worth in your back pocket, hop on the next plane, and then just shoot over to El Salvador or to Dubai or someplace where they're going to treat you and your capital a lot better. And yep. therefore, this is going to put a lot of pressure on governments to do the right thing. They can only go so far mm -hmm. before you'll get like a mass migration of these people because they're not tethered to their uh, or their wealth isn't tel tethered to a specific uh, location. Yep. And that makes a lot of sense to me for someone like myself yep. or maybe someone like you. Yep. But then I sit there and scratch my head and I look at Puerto Rico, Yep. right? So Puerto Rico, I, I lived there for a, a time in 2013 and I was one of the first people to go there yep. for, at the time it was called Act 20 and 21. Yep. I think it's called Act 60 now. Yep, yes, yep. And you, you think about this, an American citizen as of right now yep. could move to Puerto Rico and only have to spend six months of the year there. Uh -huh. And they would literally get 0% capital gains tax yep. and a maximum of 4% on their, if they had a service, you know, there's some qualifications for their business, but let's assume their business fit into that category. Yep. Uh, so a maximum of 4% on their business and a 0% capital gains tax on their gold, on their Bitcoin, on their stocks, on their bonds, what have yep. you. And how many people are taking advantage of that? It's about 10,000, approximately. Okay, out of 350 million. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you see my point? So, I, I yes, it, it is a huge advantage for people who, uh, A, have the resources, have the um, disposition yep. to do that. But for a large majority of Americans, I think you got a wife, uh -huh. you got a, you got kids, you got the kids in private schools, they've got all their friends, you've got your inner circle of friends, your family, your the grandparents, yeah. Uh, yeah. you got the Range Rover payment, you got all your buddies at the country club. It, it's 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 not as easy as hey, I'm pissed off at the government because they're potentially going to ban. Uh, you know, the, the Bitcoin that makes up 5% of my portfolio, 
So I'm going to go ahead and bounce to El Salvador yeah. or Dubai or Colombia or something like that. I, I think it's a little more complex, although I would agree that as time goes on, especially with the younger generation, uh, they're going to be more receptive to that, that the wife and or the, the husband and the wife. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about in terms of how it might affect kind of the bifurcation and global polarity, the global power structure, if you kind of say, okay, we're moving from a unipolar world to a multipolar world and all this kind of thing? Well, I'd hope that it would incentivize countries to compete even more from a standpoint uh, uh, from the, that human capital, uh -huh. right? By lowering taxes, smaller government, making it uh, easier for entrepreneurs to set up businesses and actually, uh, you know, you'll bring their skill set to that local area to produce, uh, create goods, services, and jobs. And I, I would hope it would it would uh, further incentivize that because countries would know that there are more people that have the ability to do that and are more and are more open to making that move. And therefore, uh, you know, if I lower my tax rate from X down to Y, that's going to move the needle a lot more than it would have back in the 1980s or the 1990s. Yeah. So I think from that standpoint, it, it's definitely beneficial. And I, I think, you know, you see Dubai doing that. They just got yep. rid of that 30% tax on alcohol. Uh, they've done several things to try to incentivize uh, people from Europe and the United States, uh, but that especially Europe and that area to move down and bring their capital and their skill set with them. And, you know, most people think that uh, Dubai is just all about oil. But you know from from being there that just a very very small percentage two and a half of percent GDP. of GDP yeah very very yeah the very small yeah. and uh, even from the beginning they they didn't I know they had a little bit at the beginning but it just wasn't an overwhelming amount yeah. so they've had to really um, build based on kind of the dreams of of the guy's dad that's in charge now right yeah. and he's just trying to take his vision to to the next level and. You got to take your hat off to them. They, they've done. Uh, you know, it's not a perfect well. place. Yep. But they've definitely done a good job. And uh, again, I think that's why Dubai is potentially poised to be like the London, Hong Kong, uh, maybe go so far as New York of uh, of that of the new uh, bifurcated uh, association. Let's say of those BRIC countries. You know, if they have to. It, listen, if they're trying to de-dollarize, for heaven's sakes, uh, they're not going to want everything to go through New York. Mm -hmm. And so uh, maybe they they pick Dubai. Maybe that's kind of the the new Switzerland for that whole area, especially, you know, the Switzerland used to be the place where you could store money and, and you would have privacy and you wouldn't have to worry about these things. But now all these other countries, whether you like them or you don't, they look at what happened with Russia. Uh, Russia had their dollar assets frozen yep. and they're saying, Hey, you know, we're on the United States good side now, but mm -hmm. in 10 years, who knows, who knows yep. what's going to happen. So yep. do we really want to hold our, our assets uh, in, in dollars or do we even want to hold our assets knowing their liabilities of, of someone else? And uh, if we do have to hold dollars, we would much prefer that those dollars are a liability of a, of a bank in Dubai mm -hmm. compared to uh, a bank in, in Switzerland or in, in Germany or something like that. Yeah. The Swiss, I think we're very stupid to kind of abandon neutrality on, on uh, Russia. That was kind of a, a dumb move, but anyway, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Curious. So uh, this is a big conversation, especially in the Bitcoin and gold circles is, you know, this idea of moving away from the dollar. Uh, what do you see countries moving towards if they're not going to be on the dollar? I mean, are you going to go to the Chinese yuan? Doesn't seem like a big improvement over the dollar in that sense. Uh, a lot of other currencies don't have enough liquidity. What do you What do you see as that progression? I, I, I'm I'm in the camp that I don't. Yeah. Uh, anytime soon, I, I don't see. I I don't know that you have to have something replace the dollar. Hmm. Um, I do see a world where you could have multiple currencies you wouldn't necessarily have one dominant currency mm -hmm. and you know honestly the the united states dollar didn't become the world reserve currency by decree most people think that that's what happened in 44 with Bretton woods but actually the dollar was the was being used 
uh, for the majority of settlement, even prior to Bretton Woods. So it it, it came up. Uh, are you there? Yeah, sorry, my headphone died. Just keep keep talking. I'm just going to adjust things. Sure. Yeah. Okay, okay. So starting in the 1920s, the dollar became a higher and higher percentage of global settlement. So uh, this is because the United States became more and more uh, an industrial powerhouse, a manufacturing powerhouse, really uh, a bigger player on the uh, as a percentage of the global economy. Therefore, people wanted to hold those dollars. That, you know, no one put a gun to their head. And so usually that's how kind of currencies take over and how currencies fade. So I'm not someone that's going to say that the United States dollar is going to be the world reserve currency forever. That, that's no way. And I do think that what the United States and the West chose to do uh, with the sanctions against Russia hastened the dollar's decline. But I think that it brought it down from, you know, like 25 years down to 20 years. I, I don't think it's taken it from 25 years down to five years or so. And one of the main reasons why is uh, not just the network effect of the dollar, uh, which is very, very strong. You know, I mean, uh, Bitcoiners say all the time that that's one of the reasons why Bitcoin has such a strong moat around it is the network effect against some of the other cryptocurrencies. But uh, there's one source of a currency that has the strongest network effect that the globe has ever seen, and that's the dollar. And I would argue that the network effects uh, for the dollar are way stronger than they were for any other preceding global reserve currency because of how interconnected the world is today, how much dollar denominated debt there is, and how the euro dollar banking system now uh, plays into the, the global economy. So, uh, you know, you've got that network effect, but on top of that, you, you look at uh, someone's borrowing options, right? So let's just assume that uh, you can, you've got uh, goods that can be, and you've got input costs that can be settled in some other currency or something. Let's just set that aside, uh, understanding that, you know, still 60 to 70% of the transactions are settled in dollars. Therefore, if, you, if you're Japan, as an example, you got to import a lot of energy. Um, we don't care how much yen you have. If you don't have dollars, you ain't getting the energy, right? So, <laughs> so then you got to trade your yen. You got to somehow get those dollars. Uh, but let's just set that aside for a moment, although that really contributes to that network effect. But let's say that you're XYZ widget maker in uh, Korea or Thailand or something like that. And uh, you've got options for borrowing. You could go ahead and borrow in your local local currency at, you know, especially here in Colombia, 12, 15%. Or you could go ahead and borrow in dollars at three or 4%. You know, what are you going to do? Uh, uh, especially considering everything's settled in dollars anyway, almost. Uh, you know, obviously you're going to borrow in dollars because that's where I think a currency would really have to compete with the dollar is to make it a lot more, a lot better as far as risk reward uh, in, in terms of borrowing it, right? Uh, so I think the only thing that could compete with that would be a, a central bank digital currency because that could be lent by a borrower that didn't have the constraint of a P&L. And what I mean by that is a, a central bank, and we're seeing this with the Federal Reserve right now. You know, the Federal Reserve right now is insolvent. Uh, they're, they're, they have, uh, uh, if you were to actually use gap accounting, uh, uh, and maybe that's too strong of a word, but they're, they're getting, they have more and more negative equity. Why do I say that? Because they're having to use something called a deferred asset. Uh, and if you look up a Fred chart, that's remittances back to the treasury, you see that it went from a positive, you know, 2 billion, 2 billion, 2 billion, 2 billion, down to a negative uh, 18 billion, and it's even going further negative. Why is that? Because the Fed is having to sell assets through quantitative tightening and take a loss on those, and they're having to pay a lot more in the, on the interest on the reserves that banks hold with them, those bank reserves, than they are receiving on the interest from the asset side of their balance sheet. So that that's that's not good. Any other business would be out of business. <laughs> but the Fed has this magic accounting thing called a deferred asset, which uh, they just you know tack on to the, the liability side of their balance sheet, basically. So this kind of plugs the hole 
And what it does is it's basically like an IOU they're giving themselves for future profit or future revenue. So, you know, how long can that go on? Indefinitely. They could have a, they could have $4 trillion in deferred assets on there. And I don't think anyone would, would bat an eye because, you know, at the end of the day, does the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet even matter? I would argue no. And the liability side is just them tough typing digits into a computer. So do they really need to have negative equity to have some guy go in there and just type in digits into a computer? You know, probably not. Just pay the dude 50 bucks an hour and you're good to go. So, uh, but my point is the Fed or the Chinese central bank could go ahead and extend credit to that uh, supplier in Korea or in Thailand or or uh, Colombia at a lower interest rate why than the market rate for the dollar, even with the euro dollar banks. Why? Because they, they don't really care about getting paid back. Uh, they get paid back, great. They don't, great. We got a deferred asset that we can use. And so they could undercut the dollar. Now, the, one of the issues with... Um, you know, if we really want to get into the weeds, I, I do think that that sound money or a Bitcoin standard uh, is um, desirable. I do. But I don't think people have really thought through the, the trade-offs, nor do I think people have thought through how we get from A to Z. And, um, you know, I, I know a lot of people in the Bitcoin community like to dismiss uh, borrowing altogether as though it somehow wouldn't exist because, um, you know, if we had a, a fixed money supply, then deflation would be so dramatic and we would all be getting so rich on our money that we wouldn't even need to borrow for a house and all, you know, okay, maybe, but I think the probability of that's pretty low. So then you've got to ask yourself, you know, even with the people who are adamant about Bitcoin right now and hats off to them, uh, but would you borrow in, in Bitcoin right now to buy your house or would you borrow in dollars? And I don't know one Bitcoin, uh, one Bitcoiner that would borrow in Bitcoin. And it makes sense because if you think Bitcoin's going to a million, you're going to borrow in Bitcoin and have to pay back that same number of Bitcoin 10 years into the future or whatever. Absolutely not. You're going to go broke. And then, you know, from the other side, uh, well, who's going to who's going to lend to you? And at what interest rate? So, uh, you know, those people are always going to prefer to borrow in dollars if they need to. And then they need to think about the fact that that adds to the network. And current dollar debt is really saying future dollar demand. Because you got to have dollars to, to, to pay back the debt in the first place. So I do think that there it's a very fascinating conversation as, as to how the, the world would work in that type of environment where we were either on a gold standard or we were on a Bitcoin standard where Bitcoin was base money. You know, another big question is, would you have full reserve or would you have fractional reserve? Uh, I'm someone that that sides on the, the fractional reserve uh, because I, I think if people would have chosen or if people had a uh, would naturally gravitate towards full reserve, um, I think that they would have done that back in the 1800s because they had that exact same choice back in the 1800s. And I understand that Bitcoin's portable and you don't have to have it in the banking system. And I, I get that. But uh, still, that that doesn't really pertain to people having a choice as to whether you want full reserve or fractional reserve. And the market, whether we like it or not, chose fractional reserve banking, even without the Fed, without the government getting involved, you know, that free banking system. So ironically... Uh, if we were to have full reserve, uh, we might actually require government involvement to to force that upon society because the free market may choose fractional reserve. I think it's kind of a paradox with uh, a lot of the thinking, uh, you know, with the sound money folks who who like to believe that, uh, you know, sound money would also lead to a uh, full reserve system and an absence of uh, I forgot what uh, what Mises called it, um, fiduciary media. I think uh, fiduciary media. He, I, I think is what he said, and uh, it's just kind of ironic that it maybe just maybe who knows. And I think it's a cool thought experiment, but maybe to get that uh, that absence of fiduciary media that is so crucial to getting rid of the boom bust uh, cycle, according to the Austrians, 
you would actually need the government to get involved in and mandate it. So anyway, uh, a lot of fun thought experiments there. But I think the main takeaway with your question is uh, I do think the actions of the West have uh, have sped up the process of the dollar losing reserve currency status. But I don't see that happening within the next uh, decade. That was a super excellent answer. I love that. That was uh, a yeah, really, uh, really great thought process. You had mentioned earlier about how you construct the portfolio. Uh, can you fill us in a little bit on that, that process? Sure. Yeah. And this might not be right for most people. It's it's not investment advice. It's just what I do for my personal portfolio. And I just try to keep it very simple. So I always say it's a 10-80-10 portfolio. So 10% would be insurance. For me, insurance is just gold, just physical gold. Uh, why? Because, you know, the same reasons you always hear. It's been around for 5,000 years. Uh, uh, I can pretty much bet that in 20 years, it'll buy the same amount of stuff that it buys today. Uh, obviously, from year to year, it fluctuates dramatically, but I'm not buying it to get rich. Uh, you just buy it to stay rich and uh, give it to your kids or do something like that. So, it, uh, And I think it's, for, for me, it helps me kind of sleep well at night. And, uh, you know, gold, I think is, especially when you look at gold in terms of other currencies outside the United States dollar, because there's an argument, you know, over the last couple of years, whatever, that gold hasn't kept pace with the rate of inflation. I think that's a decent argument, although it went up quite significantly. So I'd still say that if you look at it in 10 year segments, it's still buying the same amount of stuff. But if you look at gold in terms of the Colombian peso or the the, the British pound or the Japanese yen, I think it's done its job very, very well. So anyway, uh, that's just the insurance side. Now, the uh, 80% is just uh, what I would consider investments. And the way I define that is uh, things that pay me to own them. So a cash flowing real estate uh, property would be an example of an investment to me. That's just the way I define it. A dividend paying stock would be an example uh, of an investment, just something that's paying me to own it constantly. And I like that to be 80% of my portfolio because if you're getting paid to own something, it's it's very difficult to, to, to lose on that deal, right? I mean, you could have an opportunity cost, I guess, but to actually lose money on the deal, um, it, it, it's tough, right? If you're buying right, especially if you're buying cheap. And then on the other 10%, I like uh, to have speculative assets. Now, that's not a derogatory term. It's just to say that they're not paying me to own them. So gold miners would be a great example. Bitcoin would be a great example. Uh, uranium, you know, if you're buying the Sprott Trust, that would be a fantastic example of things that I would consider uh, speculative assets that for me would be perfect for that 10% uh, of, of the, the portfolio. So that's just kind of how I set it up. But again, I've got different um, objectives than a lot of people from the standpoint of, you know, I'm not 20 years old anymore. Uh, I'm not trying to get rich. Uh, I'm just trying to, to to maintain the level of purchasing power that I have right now because I'm very comfortable. I don't have to work. I retired in 2012. And if I can just make a, a nice, you know, five, 7% return on my money over the next 30 years, I'll be very, very happy with that. And uh, again, if, you're, if you've got gold and if you've got 80% of your portfolio paying you to own it, uh, there, there's a pretty good chance that you make that happen over the long run. Yeah, yeah, that's great. What do you think, because you're kind of mentioning, hey, look, real estate in a lot of places is very overpriced or it's very expensive, let's call it that. Um, and so conceivably then you're selling and you're reallocating. How do you decide within that 80% how to allocate? Well, again, cheap and expensive. And a lot of times I'm like right now, I've... I've a significant portion of the portfolio in cash. And so when I hold cash, I just hold it in T-bills. So right now I've got a model portfolio as an example for the, the, the membership site I've got. And it's literally 10% gold and 90% T-bills. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And uh, the reason is because I'm a big commodity bull over the long run. I think we're in a commodity super cycle. But as you know, things never go up in a straight line. And just because I'm a bull for, you know, into 2030 and 2035, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that I think the prices are cheap right now. 
And coal would be a great example of that. And so uh, I just like to, to wait and hold off. So my strategy right now with, with that part of the, the portfolio, at least that model portfolio, and to be clear, uh, that 108010 excludes cash. That's just the, the, the portion of the portfolio that I have invested. So I can have 90% cash and only 10% of it is allocated in that 108010 type of, of so, format. Would right? that mean that you would reduce, like let's say you sell off a whole bunch of real estate, are you then also reducing the amount of gold you're holding or you're going to hold 10% of your net worth in gold regardless? Yeah, it's it's not that structured. Honestly, it, it's very rarely that structured. So sometimes that gold position, to your point, based on what I'm selling or holding, it can go up to 15% and I'm not sitting there, you know, freaking out, losing sleep over the fact that it's not at, at 10%. It, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a moving target. I just try to uh, use that framework as, as a rough guide uh, to what the type of portfolio that I want to build. I think that's probably a better way to say it. Um, but then going back to the, uh, the the strong cash position in T-bills right now, it's just because I see that, you know, you can get a six-month T-bill for heaven's sakes at, what, 4.5%, uh, which I, I get it, you're losing money to inflation, but it's actually a lot better than having it in a dollar-denominated bank account, most of in the United States. And so uh, I think if the commodities come back down to a price that I find attractive, uh, that will be an environment where the Fed will most likely be lowering rates. So if the Fed is lowering rates from, let's say, uh, they, let's say they get it to 4.75, which is likely because that was the high watermark in the two-year treasury. And that's usually what they do is they follow the two-year treasury. So then um, let's say you buy, you know, the six month at 4.5 or something like that. And then they drop rates down to zero and the six month goes to, you know, 50 basis points. Well, that's a, a not a huge capital gain, but you get a little bit of a capital gain there if you have to sell uh, prior to maturity. And why would you sell? Because the commodities now are cheap enough to a point where you're where you find them attractive, and you might want to start buying them. So that's kind of the the goal. You know, put your dry powder in something that's giving you four point five percent, and you might get a capital gain if you get lucky. Uh, and if you if the commodity prices don't come down to a price that's attractive. Well, the worst case scenario is you just get the, the your principal back at the end of six months plus, you know, four point five percent. That's great. Well, this has been excellent. Really appreciate you coming in and sharing lots of interesting uh, interesting thoughts today. If people are interested in following you and getting to know about you, et cetera, what are the best places to do so? They can just go to YouTube or they can just Google my name. It's just George. Uh, not not Jorge, but George. <laughs> uh, although I do have some family members that call me that to this day. But uh, George Gammon, G-A-M-M-O-N, and uh, all my social media and YouTube stuff will pull up. Cool. Yeah, we'll put all the links in the comments or in the description below. So thank you once again for being here. Everyone, thanks for joining us. Go and check out George at his, uh, his social and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next video. Give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me.